thanks uh, due to the Foreign Office for getting us involved with this event early on, quite an exciting festival and we've all seen like the kind of conversations, the quality of uh, debates and discussions around tech policy which have happened all through the day today. Uh, so this one is on big data and I'm Anand Padmanabhan, I'm a fellow with the Center for Policy Research. I look at technology and society issues ranging from data protection to digital economy to OTT regulations to uh, emerging technologies, artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, so just to give a quick, you know, sense of what the thinking was behind this panel. Uh, as someone, uh, I'm a lawyer by training, has <laughs> sort of been looking at the whole space of data regulations for a while. Uh, so if you, if you go back to Sarka, the IT Act 2000, the whole idea of a computer resource was this static thing in, inside which data is stored. And then there are crimes and offenses and various different regulatory things uh, around, you know, how to, how to protect that resource. I mean, that's how you have the whole idea of hacking. And then you have the 2008 amendment and you bring in the cyber security piece of the conversation. But what has really happened post-2008 is far more fascinating and interesting, which is the rise of big data. And that in turn is connected with the rise of Web 3.0, which is the semantic web. And machines which are capable of, you know, processing all this information and then can actually profile all of us, right? And Facebooks and all these areas, you know, business models are, uh, you know, symptomatic of that at some level, but we have gone far beyond Facebook today when, it, when we talk about data. Uh, so as far as India goes, the interesting part of the story is that uh, some of our policy makers have been thinking quite uh, seriously about it, especially over the past few years. Uh, Niti Ayo came out with this uh, strategy document a little while ago, uh, thinking about the possibilities of artificial intelligence in various kinds of use cases ranging from mobility to smart infrastructure to education, healthcare and so on. Uh, so broadly the debate is about two different things and, and both are important but both have to be at some level kept separate while interlinked naturally because policy and regulation is an important part of technology today. Uh, but the two different components are uh, the proactive vision around around technology and how, how India is looking at artificial intelligence as part of a, you know, emerging tech, you know, leadership position that we can take. And the second aspect of it is how do we treat core values like privacy, uh, equality and so on when it comes to uh, these new technologies. And uh, at the heart of all this is data, right, and big data because you, you need huge volumes to propel emerging tech. Uh, so with that, uh, let me introduce the panelists for today. Uh, we have Dr. Avik Sarkar from Niti Aayog. Avik. We have uh, Prerna Mukharia from Outline India. I guess after coffee, nobody is, I don't know, this is a very strange effect. Post coffee, you're meant to applaud. <laughs> a big round of <laughs> applause for our <laughs> panelists. You know, I mean, you should have seen the energy outside, you know, when the earlier panel was going on, these guys were so animated. So you have to get it out of them now. <laughs> the only way is to applaud. <laughs> Keep applauding. Uh, we have Bishaka from IBM. <laughs> and we have Burgess from Shechat. <laughs> so I just introduced you guys by your names and organizations, but starting So I, I'll request each of you to give a one minute, you know, quick roundup of what you do in your respective organizations because I just mentioned the name of the organization and left it at that. Beginning with you, Avi. So I head the data analytics cell at Niti Aayog. This is like a horizontal role. I work with various verticals like say energy, healthcare, and trying to analyze their data for the purpose of public policy needs and also the framing policies on how data can be used in general for governance and be, for better governance, better and effective governance. That, uh, that's just for data as one. And also uh, AI is another strategy paper that we came up with earlier this year. So we are looking also, also on the aspect of emerging technologies. Prerna. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Prerna and I run a for-profit social enterprise that's called Outline India. 
And we're basically meant to be the ears and eyes on the ground for anybody looking to do a good job in the development sector. We do a lot of work with policymakers, think tanks, not-for-profits, and uh, the government, uh, and CSR people as well. And we basically believe that you know uh, social schemes should be measured, and technology is a big part of it. Uh, we're trying to create a tech platform that's called Track Your Metrics, wherein we're trying to create a marketplace for donors, funders, and NGOs to come together, and again, uh, for the exchange to happen on the basis of micro data sets. So uh, I'm a big believer of small data, because I still feel like uh, a big chink chunk of India still lives in its villages and may not be as online as we might want them to be. Thank you. Uh, my, my name is Bishaka. Uh, I'm from IBM and part of the global team uh, on the global and regulatory affairs, focusing especially for India on uh, technology policy, uh, which ranges uh, right from policies that impact all the emerging technologies and like artificial intelligence, which Anand began with, but other, other areas also. Uh, I'm Burgess. I head public policy at ShareChat, which is uh, India's largest Indian language social media platform, um, which is today available in 14 Indian languages with over 30 million active users. Um, at ShareChat, I take care of not only the the policy issues that, that social media companies in India have to deal with, such as privacy and data localization, but also uh, other issues that ail us, like fake news and problematic content. So. That's, that's largely what I do at ShareChat. Thank you all uh, for taking time out for this panel. Uh, so I'll begin with you, uh, Dr. Sarkar. Uh, the, the strategy document that you know, we were mentioning a little while ago uh, outlines various you know, steps that India needs to take uh, to, to make ourselves a global leader when it comes to artificial intelligence. Uh, while one part of the report particularly looks at the various use cases, uh, what is more important and interesting is the fact that it acknowledges the, the gaps in our data ecosystem. Uh, and it also gives some direction uh, broadly to address it, in, including fundamental research in AI and translational research as well. Uh, so could you share your thoughts on where it's going from this document and how you see this evolve? Um, so I think when we, when we look at... Um, data or big data per se, um, and we look at artificial intelligence, we have to understand that artificial intelligence is just one of the very small use cases of what data can give us. And we have to look at into data in a very much holistic view. Uh, then going back to, we have to understand what our legacy has been. In the last 70 years, our legacy has been primarily based on surveys. And in surveys, we have been, like, I, I'll talk particularly about our development. Like, if you want to uh, see, like, there's a policy making happen, like, there is a problem that is identified, you come up with a policy, you get, you pass that as a, as a cabinet note or a bill, then you get the funds for it, then the implementation happens, and then comes the evaluation of that, where companies like Outline are champions. So... This cycle, by the time it happens, it can often be four to five years. By that time, you know how bureaucrats get transferred and how governments change. So it becomes very difficult to put anyone accountable for the whole thing. So for uh, Niti Aayog, when this thought came in, when this new government came in, was that uh, it's not new, it's coming to the end now. <laughs> when this <laughs> current government came in, was to uh, if, do this evaluation every at a more frequent manner. You, uh, I think uh, many in the audience might know about the National Family and Health Survey, the most uh, uh, proper health survey for healthcare and nutrition uh, needs about children or malnutrition practices. Till now, it has been happening at an interval of 10 years. So you do a policy and you, and you measure it every, every 10 years. So from moving from uh, now, uh, after we coming in, that uh, survey has been recommended every three years. Then you see the big debate on jobs happening there because there is no credible surveys happening on jobs for the last five years. There and there are like even when the this surveys happen, there were multiple ministries. So there is some looking at some sectors, some missing out some of the sectors. So there is no coherent view. So one thing that we wanted to 
to to come in was a real time evaluation and this real time evaluation is definitely not a big data real time evaluation in the sense that you have terabytes or gigabytes of data so this is moving from something that happened every 10 years to to something that can be done every year so that itself is a big data if you look at the government they are telling we are now doing real time things because for them 10 years to one year is a real time aspect even though it's not like real time, we, we think in real time is microseconds, nanoseconds is what we, we would like to think real time as if you go by the traditional definitions of big data. But that is also uh, what has, we have done is that the National Family and Health Survey covers about 144 or 143 parameters. We are looking at our health index of states where we are looking at only about 30 parameters, few on the input side and heavily on the outcome side doing surveys and also trying to collect some operational data and get a sense of how these sectors are doing. So this is like we have already done it for education, healthcare, um, we have done it for water management. Like water management is like not how much water you have, but given whatever water you have, how well you manage it, how, how many more farmers can get the water through irrigation and how is, is well managed that thing. Uh, then we have for all the 16 X SDG goals, we have a state ranking that's not released yet, but the final work is going on on that. We have something for innovation. Uh, innovation we see as a very important aspect because uh, it has a very um, complementary role to ease of doing business, which Amitabh Khan uh, started when he was in DIPP. It's about starting a business, the ease of doing business ranking is. But what we see innovation is that once you have started a business, if you have a depth in that state, then you can sustain that business. Otherwise, starting will remain as a start and you will die down in a few years. So looking at the innovation index, the state, and for each of these indexes, we also have an international index in which India is measured. So our aim is to front. To improve India's index, we have to improve the state indexes and make what are the points available. So we, we give like scores on like four, four or five areas for each of these things, or 10 areas, and then states can see that and then they can improve. For like what happened for ease of doing business index, when it was launched in year one, we had the usual people like Andhra, Gujarat, Maharashtra coming on the top. By year three, Jharkhand was in the top three. Because we are giving very objective scores for each of those parameters, and they could work on those scores and improve that. So that so there is a so for us uh, when we look at data, this is one of the big aspects that we are we are looking at. Now coming back to your question, because we are looking into there is a lot of things can and this in in all of this there was no AI, there was no artificial intelligence. You can do a lot of development um, without artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is important, and people think that that's the only thing that can take India out of poverty, but that's not the, the, the reality. <laughs> that's not the, the reality. Uh, so, and then the, uh, coming uh, from there, I think there's a lot of data that is lying in house that we can use for uh, for good uh, for social good. Say you you go, we all do our shopping in the Big Bazaar, more or Reliance Fresh, where the customer data is not there. There is possibly some customer ID. But if you collect this data at an aggregate level across all over India, you know at a very granular level what India eats at a like Mohalla level. You already know from the uh, Agmark net and on all the agriculture production data what India produces at what level. Logistics is a big cost. If you can optimize that, it reduces your law cost of, of logistics drastically. And these are some of the very low hanging fruits, but these are not very interesting to talk about, so we do not talk about it. But there are efforts going on into trying to see how this thing can be, can be done. Then we can, we can look into sales of cements and, and steel, iron steel, to look at how the uh, construction market is doing. So there are a lot of low-hanging data which is uh, which is available. Uh, there are a lot of studies where you can say, like if I uh, talk about the wealth index, another uh, different thing. Uh, wealth index is something that gets measured only during the census. What happens, which area is how much people on the wealth side. There are studies that has been done by MIT researchers on Rwanda, where they look at mobile phone data aggregate mobile phone data across across areas and the network to to uh, estimate the wealth of the localities. 
So this is, and if you, this is like, you don't have to get the personal data of the people, you can get the anonymized data in a, in a sandbox environment, this can be done. Until now, I have not even touched AI. Right. So there's a lot that can be done, and 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 then once this data is made available, they can also be used for AI purposes because there is a large many use cases. We are already doing a few use cases on on AI. Uh, I think someone is doesn't like <laughs> <laughs> my criticism on AI. I think <laughs> so. So I think I can talk about that. I think sure. Maybe. I think there are two important things there. One is the whole demystification of AI and or technology and. Big tech and big data, yes. right? I mean that that linkage is not necessarily to be to to be there to get the benefit of a big data ecosystem. Yes, and the yes. second is the delinking of personal data, the whole personal data controversy or regulatory, you know, perspectives on personal data from big data, which could also be anonymized data. Exactly. But with that, uh, Prerna, just uh, uh, coming back to this thought about, you know, you don't need big tech, right, for, right. for interesting data insights. Right. Right. But still, there are many challenges in India, right? So could you sort of... Uh, Identify for us some of these challenges that you have faced while yeah. gathering um, data on the right. ground. So, Anand, I think, you know, uh, I often like to tell people that, uh, you know, a lot of conversations we have are born out of the echo chamber, chambers that we are living in, right? Um, if you think about the number of Indians online, let's say 800 million, and I know that number is coming down, but even if you talk about those that people that are online, what is the kind of internet access do they have? How do they access this data? It's usually the male lead in a lot of households who gets access to WhatsApp and Facebook. And what is the kind of information that's being transacted? Is it news? Is it information to do with their farms, work related? No, not so much, right? So I mean, there's a lot of limitations that I think we in these fancy conferences fail to discuss. And I think a lot of India's needs reside in its small data sets, right? And even when we talk about a lot of government service that are done, I don't think we can call a lot of them big data sets. They are not, right? These are matrices of, let's say, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 into a couple of lakh people, right? And um, I think India faces two sorts of problems. One, um, lots of data on certain counts. And second is not enough data, right? And when I talk about uh, lots of data sets, I want to talk about you know, small not-for-profits, donors, funders uh, that reside across the country, and, and they all collect data in their own ways and measures. What happens to those data sets? These are these, there are these disparate data sets that reside across the country. No one knows about them. India really needs to learn how to save, organize, and recycle its data sets, right? I think one of the bigger problems that India faces is information asymmetry. No one knows who's doing what. There are these big funders coming in. The World Bank is doing so much. Some of the CSR companies are doing so much. The government is doing so much. But there's very little conversation about the data sets that these stakeholders have, right? And then if I come to cross-sectoral or macro data sets, even within the government, there will be websites at the block level, at the district level, uh, at the state level, and at the center. A lot of themes are then cross-sectoral, so maybe child care and nutrition, right? And if we as researchers or policymakers go looking for these data sets, these data sets don't speak to each other, right? And that is so problematic. I mean, that is a travesty if you think about it, right? That there's so much data sitting in a lot of servers, no one knows where they are, but if we could create a conversation around it, we could really change the ecosystem given how important data is uh, within public policy and all these debates, right? Um, my other problem, stems from the way the development sector behaves, right? Uh, there's lack of accountability, there's lack of a marketplace, unlike the corporate space which competes on the basis of big data sets and selling and marketplaces, the development sector takes pride in some of its more traditional ways. I don't know of many policymakers and many researchers who would take up a lot of technology within the policy space. I mean, us moving to digital data collection was hailed as a big, big step, and it's really not, right? I mean, my firm and I, we were one of the few who started using drones for digital data collection. And again, there was so much confusion around the data policies that existed around it, right? So there were some confusing laws such as, if you're flying the drone under 100 meters, you don't need DGCA permissions. If it goes up above 100 meters, you need DGCA permissions. And so everybody's like, okay, let's just fly it beneath 100 meters, right? And then there's this whole conversation around how do you get these various stakeholders to act responsibly about the data sets that they collect, 
right? So in terms of development sector and, and the mountains of data or the lack of data sets that we might have, there's so much to be done. In terms of, I think, um, not enough data, I think India still doesn't know on a lot of counts uh, the number of not-for-profits that exist. India still doesn't track a lot of its schemes. I think one of the more disappointing things that I have been, you know, I, I've noticed in the last few years, so when Planning Commission existed, we first set up something called the IEO, the Independent Evaluation Organization. And of course, when Planning Commission was abolished, uh, there was no IEO. So IEO was actually set up to evaluate all government schemes and whether the data sets were correct and whether any government policies were having any impact at all. When we moved to the Niti Aayog, it set up its own DMEO, but that critical word independent disappeared. There is no independent organization that is required to do only this, and I think that's so problematic. Anand. Right. right. So a lot of public policy insights can only really come when there's independence in the way you handle the data. And speaking about independence, uh, Bishaka, I mean, one of the things that Prerna did mention was the fact that there are these data sets lying in silos and, and all of that, and we need to sort of read them all together, right? But then the, the other side of that story is the re-identification risk, right? Many of these data sets could be anonymized by themselves, but when you combine all of this together, there's a huge possibility that you go back or closer to the personal data reality of a particular individual or a community, uh, as is mostly the case with big data analytics. And uh, today we have some degree of responses forthcoming on some of these issues in the form of the personal data protection bill. Uh, so what we are seeing today is a, a conversation in India about a regulatory uh, you know, response to personal data and which is built around some of these fears. Uh, how thoughtful do you think uh, these responses are to the concerns of the industry, to the concerns or the real risks that actually arise on the ground when it comes to data handling both by the state and non-state actors? And what are your views overall on this regulatory response mechanism that is currently uh, being uh, proposed? Thanks, Anand. Um, a very, very interesting points that you've put in, and I think it's not particular to India. It's actually a global phenomena that we are seeing around uh, everywhere. Um, in fact, even in India, it's not a new debate. I mean, uh, many of you would recall that way back in 2012, we had a committee report which talked about privacy and actually outlined um, nine uh, point code for enforcing privacy. And, and surprisingly, after six years, when we have uh, the report of the Sri Krishna committee as well, it's pretty much aligned to what was said six years ago. So I think uh, many of these questions that you're asking are pretty fundamental. What they go back to is very fundamental to us. I mean, if you're talking about privacy, if you're talking about security, if you're talking about trust that we expect in data handling, data usage, I think it's fundamental and not just for data, for everything. It's in the context of data that might be relatively new. And uh, maybe it's relatively new because, um, you know, the fact is that the euphoria of free services and, and its potential and how useful it was is kind of subsiding right now. Um, within the enterprises, uh, you know, uh, the use and value of data was well known and continues to be discovered. Uh, and, and you know, you, you did refer to some of the data that exists which is not personal and, and that's something that even within enterprises that's being leveraged, be it for, uh, you know, supply chain efficiencies. In healthcare, for example, yes, it's personal data, but um, I mean, coming from IBM, I can speak uh, for the Watson platform, the way it's helping oncologists actually augment their diagnostic and, and you know, treatment capabilities. So again, here you refer to jobs. Um, you know, when we look at data, when we look at what data can do potentially, um, it's, it's on how you want to use it. And therefore, the regulatory response is also directed towards that. If we look at, uh, you know, why this debate in the last two years and why this whole thing on, um, you know, globally, why this concern is because there were certain incidents which have, which have triggered it, right? And, and the regulatory response is trying to contain that. But having said that, you know, it's a problem that's being addressed and you really cannot have a very broad, uh, all-encompassing regulation which, which actually can address this problem. You have a problem, fix it. 
you know, that's one part of it. And overall, then look at enablement. I mean, all of us, you talked about small data, you talked about, uh, you know, policy, uh, data-driven policy measures. Um, uh, it's, it's all possible because the quantity of data has increased. But it's not just mere number of data, but also the nature, the form of data. Earlier, transactions didn't have data around it. We were not able to capture it. Today, she's done it. She's done it with drones. We are able to capture that data. We can store it. We can analyze it. Now, do you really want regulations to stifle that? I don't think we would want that. We would want enablement, right? So effectively, what you're coming down to is two things. One, how can you use data in a responsible manner? And how can the stakeholders in the value chain collaborate to build and maybe to some extent rebuild the trust? So in the Indian context also, I think that's what exactly we would want to do. Building the trust, rebuilding the trust, but at the same time trying to use the data. I mean, I think it's important for all of us to know that countries who have traditionally been rich with natural resource may not have been the most prosperous nations. Because what happens is, it's not about resource being available, but with what you do with it. Something that you referred to, you referred to as well. And I think that's true for India as well. Just by having data or collecting data is not going to lead us to any place. We have to figure out how do we use it? How do we use it in a responsible manner? You know, companies like ours, IBM, 100 years old, traditionally been custodian of data for all our clients. These are questions that have been debated for, for a few years, even before it, you know, became trending <laughs> like it is today. And, and we, we have, as we, you know, get into the system, we have, we have uh, principles around which uh, we design products. Security by design, privacy by design are something that GDPR put on the plate for everybody. But these are things that are inherent and have to be inherent. Accountability by design, privacy by design, security by design. And I think these, this is not just restricted to regulatory response. It has to be a response which comes from the value chain, from the technologists, from the regulators, as well as the users. I think the users also have a responsibility. Thanks, Bisha. I especially appreciate the candor with uh, which you, uh, you know, pointed out that uh, having a resource is very different from unlocking its value. And this has happened in the past with India's biodiversity scenario too. I mean, the Biodiversity Act had all these laudable objectives, but finally, if you look at how much we've really experimented or researched and understood our biodiversity and ecosystem around that, it's very little. Uh, and, and I think a similar you know, situation could arise with data. And, and that takes me finally to you, Burgess. And uh, interestingly, because in many cases, today the villain of the piece seems to be social media. I mean, you can talk about all the great benefits of big data and then you say, but social media, you know, I mean, there is uh, Cambridge Analytica, there is all this stuff happening there. I mean, and you could see that even play out with the tech industry, right, where Apple and Microsoft today are, are taking a stance which is uh, sort of uh, saying that we guys are separate from, or we are the old tech, or we are separate from the Facebooks and the others, you know, who are doing phenomenal amount of other unspeakable things with uh, data of individuals. And this directly goes to the issue of trust, right, because unless you have some degree of uh, privacy, respect for privacy in the social media space, uh, a few rot rotten apples can, you know, make the whole space, you know, uh, solid, right? So what are your thoughts, particularly on non-regulatory responses, right? One is, you know, you have the state playing this policeman, but I think we all agree at some level that in a country like India, that may not even really work too well. So what are the other ways in which uh, your platform is trying to address this issue and you think more broadly we should be thinking about uh, privacy and and some of these other concerns. Uh, okay, so so I like that you you already have painted me as a villain. No, no, not you. Uh, social or, media. Or social I mean, there media. could be good players, you know, the, okay. the good children. Um, but so so one of the, the unique things that makes ShareChat very interesting today and is that our user base is is so, solely folks of come on the internet for the first time. Our target audience is uh, Indians living in tier two, tier three cities. Uh, they've got their first mobile phone. Um, they want to enjoy the benefits of social media. Other platforms are, are, are too too fancy for them. Um, so if you look at Instagram, for instance, it's it's all about great beaches, fancy coffees, and and the like. Um, and and the other part is that these these users don't 
feel comfortable using a platform which is not in their native language. Um, and so today with 30 million users, we have you know amazing insights about the kind of things that folks in tier two, tier three cities in India are doing. Um, for instance, I, I, one thing that I, I disprove about what Predna said is that women don't have access to the internet. Um, surprisingly, on our platform, we have a large user base that is uh, that are women. What are they searching for? They're searching for some very interesting things on the platform, things like sari blouse designs. They literally make images because our, our platform is user-generated content, so they literally make uh, designs, take pictures, put it up on the platform. So there's sari blouse designs, there's Mandy designs, for, for those in the audience who don't know Mandy, it's you know tattoo designs. Um, and and the kind of content that A people are creating and sharing um, is 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 very interesting. Um, the other thing that, that we are seeing from our perspective and, and we see a lot of data around this is the kind of interest that people have in different types of content on a daily basis. So be it political content, uh, be it entertainment, be it fashion. And these are users who are not on other platforms, so at some point they're also going to become very attractive to advertisers and, and other players in the in the larger internet space. Um, but something that, that you know, uh, Bishaka mentioned and, and I think is very core to this is what is our value about how do we look at all of this data? Um, our company was started by three, three young kids from IIT Kanpur three years back and one of the things that we are very focused about and very concerned is ensuring the privacy of our users. Um, our users do not give, the, give their email ID to us. One reason being that most Indians who have come online on their mobile phone don't have an email ID. Um, they, the very nature of how Android works is that they buy the mobile phone, the store owner you know, puts in a common email ID and that's it. Unlike an iPhone, you don't need to keep putting in a password every time you download an app. So their identity is their mobile phone number. And um, so all that, the, the only information that we take, and we try to be lean about this, is we take whether th th their sex, their date of birth, and their mobile number and name. That's it. Um, unlike other platforms which will you know, ask, where do you work? What do you do? You know, are you straight, not straight? Are you interested in this? Are you not interested in that? We, don't, we currently don't do that. And, and we plan not to take too much information of the user. So we try to be lean when it comes to taking data from the user. The other thing is that we are very concerned and, and we've seen other platforms um, you know, become villains um, with, with Cambridge Analytica and all of that. And so we are very concerned that we don't want to be that player. We want to be an Indian platform for Indians where Indians feel safe and comfortable using it. That said, um, I think the question that, that we always have is, how many people have actually left, even in this audience for that matter, how many people have left Facebook because of their privacy issues? Anyone who has left Facebook uh, because of their privacy issue, not for anything else? Not because you don't like Facebook. Not anymore. because you don't like Facebook. Or because or. Instagram took over your attention. Uh, and do you use any of Facebook's other platforms? Do you use Instagram or WhatsApp? So you did. <laughs> so so you, but but you still but you still use a you stay don't use young, Instagram. Stay foolish, as Steve Jobs said. <laughs> and and how many of you use WhatsApp? Those who have left uh, Facebook, you still use WhatsApp? Yeah. So I mean, you you may leave Facebook, but you're still in but that Facebook ecosystem, right? Facebook doesn't leave you. Facebook doesn't leave you. <laughs> right. Um, so I think uh, so. So the, one of the things that we have noticed, and and I was discussing this with Anand too, is that the user doesn't really care so much about um, their privacy as much, right? It's more regulatory problems that platforms face. And, and coming to the privacy bit, in India, most users are not aware of privacy as a, con as a concept. In fact, there is no Hindi word for privacy. There is no word for privacy in Hindi. The word for privacy in Hindi is gopniyata. And what does gopniyata mean? It means secrecy, right? The concept of privacy and, and secrecy are two very different things. So one of the things that we, we are planning to do and we've been doing some of it already is, is training or you know, you know, educating our users about the fact that they should not be giving out too much information. 
If you're having a random chat with someone, you're sharing content, do not put out information about yourself. A lot of users, you know, put out their email ID and their password. There are users who have up uploaded their Aadhaar card because they don't realize what can happen. Um, so privacy is something that we are very driven about, but the unfortunate part is that most Indians don't understand privacy. They don't understand the, the, the fine line between what should be shared and what shouldn't be shared on the internet. Um, so, so I think that's a little bit about what we are doing on, with the data that we have and what we are doing with it. Right. Thanks, Purchas. I mean, so I think when there is a market failure though, right, in certain situations like this where the consumer doesn't care, uh, the incentive for the industry is to, in most cases, maximize the data that they gather. I mean, some platforms might behave more responsibly, but there is a general set of incentives there to, you know, maximize data. And that is why the government is pushing for a regulatory response, right? And part of that response has been to think about localizing. Uh, so, uh, Avik, I mean, what are your thoughts about this whole idea that, you know, you have the data residing in servers in India, and it could potentially, you know, lead to more responsibility, more uh, enforcement from the governments and uh, more capability of enforcement. I mean, it's it's become a thing now, right? I mean, you saw that with the RBI directive on financial data. Uh, we have seen that with the data protection bill, whether it survives in the final version is anybody's guess. Uh, the the e-commerce policy now redacted also mentioned localization. So it will be interesting to know all your thoughts, in fact, uh, but beginning with you, on whether localization is one such, you know, regulatory response to address a market failure, you know, issue here. So, I think we have to first understand what is the reason why this data localization has been done. Uh, so, uh, I think there is another ministry, the Metis, who is looking into that. So, I, I do not have my official views on that. But I can, I just share my personal views. These are like strictly personal views on, on this topic. Um, so, I do not understand what the what the reasons are. There are discussions about uh, for investigation purposes, possibly monetization purposes, uh, getting handled to this data. So, so there are, there are going multiple things. Um, so th you have to understand a few things. We are talking about uh, data servers being set here. I talk about, look at it as a three-way matrix, not only as a server and the data, you have to see who is the company. Is it a Indian company or US company? And then the board control of that company. If you look into these three factors, if all three are Indian, then you have complete control over them. The people give that example of, the, of, of say US government getting better access to Facebook data as compared to Indian, because all three is US. Right. In, in, in this case, even if you get a server here, the management control and the company will not become Indian. So it will remain a challenge uh, to, to get access to it. So I think you have to look into this three-way matrix. Um, a very interesting thing that I also uh, looked into is that um, about when you look at data and management con and control, two, uh, two uh, sites which uh, a lot of the Indians use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and this is very much related to our social, cultural aspects. One is for listening to songs in Ghana. And, and the other is uh, Big Basket, which is where we do our shoppings every day, which tells what our eating choices are and social choices are. Uh, both of this, the funder and the management control, is with the Alibaba and the Tencent group. Right. Servers might be in India, companies yeah. might be in India. Right. So, so, so they will dictate, as according to me, personal views, they right. will dictate what they want out of the data. Right. They can possibly mine this data better. So even if we have the servers in India, we can only tell, okay, there is so-and-so person who is um, uh, who has possibly done some fraudulent transaction, give his or her data. Or you can just do it. We'll get a one single piece of data. Whenever you move that thing from data to big data as the title of this, you have to look at the whole data to get the trends. Until unless you get the whole data, you will not get what are the uh, social trends of people listening to songs in India. How are the preferences of people listening to songs online changing across the years? This answers to get that you need access to the whole database across years to answer a question, how are the... So Chinese companies uh, are better placed than anyone in Bollywood today to understand which uh, 
type of songs they should invest in because they, right. are, they own the old data. Right. Vishaka, as a follow-up to that, uh, I mean, the, the fact about Chinese companies is interesting because it's one of the underlying rationales other than access for the government is the fact that China has built this wonderful domestic, you know, ecosystem, uh, AI-powered and all of that, and uh, India needs to go the same way, and one way to achieve that could be, you know, having the data located here. Uh, what are your views on, on that, you know, rationale? I mean, does it hold good? So when we're talking about data being held here, I think I'll just go back to my initial uh, statement when I said that resources being here doesn't mean anything. It's about how you're able to monetize it. And, um, you know, specifically on data localization also, uh, given that it's been uh, brought up in the context of the personal data protection bill, um, it's very important that we understand the motivation behind why localization has been suggested. And if you're looking at uh, the reason for localization being privacy, I think it's very clear that privacy uh, is not guaranteed by localization. It's the other provisions related to consent, purpose, collection, storage, uh, use, uh, which, which would actually, uh, you know, uh, guarantee and protect privacy. If you're looking uh, from a law enforcement perspective, again, which you talked about in terms of access, uh, you know, let's let's look at do, if you if you think that being here, people and law enforcement agencies have unfettered access to data. I think that violates privacy. So, so you know, that's in contradiction, right? So, even even if you have the law enforcement agencies actually looking for data for legitimate purpose. There has to be a process. That process is important wherever the data resides, right? And uh, and when we are looking at uh, you know the breakdown that we have seen in some cases with respect to uh, requests for data from other countries, uh, I think it's important that the process breakdown be addressed because even if data is here, you need the process. Everybody has uh, data uh, regulations. Everybody wants uh, some say in the data that has originated from their country. I think governments have to talk to each other to set these processes right. We have examples of how governments have, co have you know, collaborated, be it in the financial sector. I think it, it happens across countries. Even in law enforcement areas, there are examples. Things break down, but then people figure out a way. And I think it... That aspect has to be worked in the government-to-government -government mechanism. And companies, I'm sure, would be willing to comply. I, I fail to see a company who has been presented with a legitimate request from a law enforcement agency actually denying access because no company wants to break laws unless there is willful and, you know, criminal intent, which is a different matter. Right? right. So I think somewhere um, this whole thing of data localization solving all these problems, I think there needs to be a very, very detailed analysis of the problem and the possible solution because you can't use a sledgehammer to solve, you know, a problem, really. You really need to fix the problem here and, and get, get it right. Burgess, uh, I mean, ShareChat is a biggish startup. So where is your server located before, you, before I get your thoughts on localization? <laughs> We are proudly Indian. Wow. Your data is in India. Okay. In Bombay. Right. Um, and yes, it is, it is, everything about ShareChat is Indian. Right. Except our investors. So, uh, so what about your views on localization? Is that too Indian? <laughs> or uh, is it, is it open to having servers located abroad? Um, so, we are broadly, we broadly believe that data localization is good. There's nothing wrong in it. Um, if Apple wants to operate in China, it builds a server in China, right? A American company wants to do business in, in China, it, it plays by China's rules. Google wants to go there, they start building out a product that abides by China's rules. Now the IBMs of the world and the American companies will obviously cry and cry and cry, and no offense to IBM specifically, but you know, American companies will cry Global folks will cry, but it, there have been many instances where social media platforms have refused to take down content, have refused to share information with police. There was a girl who committed suicide because she filed a complaint about some content on Facebook. They refused to, to, to deal with it, and she committed suicide. Will it change things? We don't know. But 
to folks who claim that, oh, if you do data localization, you know, foreign companies may exit India. They may find it too tough to do business here. Well, China did it. We have seen that China has built a large ecosystem. Today, American apps are copying Chinese apps. Today, Facebook Messenger wants to be more and more like WeChat. Today, payment systems want to be more and more like Alipay. So what's wrong in trying it out? If Facebook leaves, there'll be an Indian alternative. If some other tech company leaves, we'll, we'll build it up. If it's, it's not going to be the end of the world. If Google left China, it's not like people over there can't search the internet, right? They have a search engine that's sometimes considered better than Google. Let's try data localization. There have been many instances where tech companies have refused to give data. Now, why they have refused, you know, you can argue till the cows come home. Was the request, you know, lawful? Did they follow all processes, et cetera, et cetera. But there have been instances where they have refused to give data, which is one reason why the RBI, you know, overnight decided data localization for finance companies operating in India. Besides the fact that the data is Indian data. If you're making profits in India, why can't you abide by Indian laws? If the data is Indian, when the government wants it, why do you have to say that you must follow American law? Boss, you're running a company in India, you're making money in India, the data is Indian, but I need to follow some, you know, government law of US or Singapore, whatever. You know, why the hell should I bother about those laws? If you want to operate in India, operate by Indian law. Otherwise, please go away. Today, if Visa and MasterCard leave India, you have Rupee, you have Paytm, you have UPI, and we'll have many more alternatives that come up. Right. UPI is a fantastic alternative. Uh, you have That's UPI. Right. Uh, you have, and which is why you then have MasterCard going back in the US, you know, complaining to US Trade Department or whatever, you know, crying that, oh, look, India's, you know, Modi is saying Rupee is better. Yes, Rupee is better. People want to use Rupee. So if MasterCard goes away, the world in India will not stop. You know, financial Great. transactions will still continue. So I think that's very sufficiently clear that, you know, where you rely on the localization debate. So Prerna, coming to you, I'm not going to put you on the spot to arbitrate this <laughs> issue. <laughs> but on a separate point, because you did mention the whole issue of independence, right? And independent evaluation of what we do with data. So let me just bring the elephant in the room, Aadhaar. Right. Is Aadhaar a big data project? Maybe not. Could it be? Maybe yes. But under the current circumstances, post the Supreme Court verdict, we don't know now where it's headed as far as private authentication goes. And there is considerable push towards data minimization. And in my reading of whatever has happened, part of the reason is simply the lack of an independent agency to, to evaluate how the state is using big data. So shifting gears a little bit from private sector and localization and, you know, data in the hands of private players and what they do with it, going back to state and how state handles data. Your thoughts on, you know, how one could have a better public use regulatory system for big data? Um, I think one of the biggest problems we have is lack of clarity. Right? No one knows what the state is doing with the data sets they collect. No one knows who all have access to it. Um, let's not get into leakages. I think we've seen a lot of newspaper articles on the extent of leakages and, uh, you know, uh, the number of stakeholders who might have access to it and how cheap it is to buy Aadhaar data sets, right? I think when you get into the realm of the kind of data sets that India is looking at, of course, a lot of these problems will abound, right? But I think what India needs is a sit-down, looping in private stakeholders, public stakeholders, policy makers, and to draw out very clean, clear policies on who all will have access to these data sets, what all this will be used for, and for the user or the end user to have the option to opt out in certain cases, and for the user to sort of chip in with whether they want their data sets to be used for X and Y and Z and A and B, right? I think the other issue at hand is consent, right? Um, so for instance, when I talk about the data bill, Anand, I think uh, one of the bigger problems we have is the retrogressive nature of the data bill that India is currently looking at. Um, so the bill currently proposes that for data sets that we had collected umpteen years ago, you have to now allow respondents to opt out. But my data set stands redundant 
if I don't have their contact number anymore, this is some respondent who lived somewhere, and of course, people in rural areas change their mobile numbers, like they change clothes. So what happens to these data sets? And a lot of these are panel data sets that even the government uses repeatedly, right? So my point is that can we please have policies that are realistic? What I do understand is that we have to allow for a finite amount of time for the caveat cases to be figured out. But what is crucial is that these data sets be maintained in a very systematic manner that these be maintained on servers that are present in India, that a finite number of people have access to these data sets, and that we set out very clear uh, processes of what happens if there's a leakage so we know who's responsible. There has to be a recourse action to the user whose data set was, or whose data point was leaked, right? And I think th that, that might really change the way we look at things right now. Right. Thanks, uh, Prerna. So rapid fire round before we go to Q&A. Each of you, uh, one minute. Uh, the question is very simple. For each of you personally, what is the one step you would identify as important for India to become an AI superpower with amazing big data analytics happening here? Starting with you, Avik. Uh, I think quality research, uh, which are outcome oriented, and I think, and then the outcomes are measured, measurable outcomes. Sure. Like say, like say, uh, there is quality research happening there, and there is also research happening in say right. IBM research sit with the Vishaka sitting here. There are m ways to evaluate the research, whether research is performing or not. And then, and then these positions of of professors uh, uh, having a dual role in industry and and thing. Like say, I think the, the lady who leads Facebook uh, in in Canada is also a researcher. So you people who have, have dual role. Here is like professor, matlab sannyas type ka role. We are still in the Gurukul system. A professor is not supposed to make money. That's the image that we have. This is a, the poor person who only teaches all his life. We have to understand that the professor and academic is someone who can make money. And they, if they are not, and they, if they are not performing, they should lose their job. High end research, High. basically. So Prerna, what about? Perform or no. um, I think it would be amazing if. Uh, People not just in tier two, tier three cities where, let's say, you know, your app operates, but people across the rural country can get access to internet. More women, more children getting access to information. And I don't just mean Facebook and WhatsApp, but, you know, all sorts of things. So, for instance, right now you see free Wi-Fi at railway stations, certain railway stations, right? So, public availability of Wi-Fi for access and not just internet. I think a lot of people across the country use a simple Java phones. They don't use smartphones. So IVR to them is very crucial. I think it's important that India thrive and endorse technology that's currently available, obviously move towards better technology as we grow, but uh, find a way to use existing technology to the benefits of its people. So Bharat Net, digital inclusion, basically. But, Ambani, Vishaka, but I think Ambani has done that. He's given everybody <laughs> internet. <laughs> right. It is Let's so not. cheap. You have 2 GB a day for like literally you know a rupee a day well. uh, or maybe two rupees a day which is I mean which is why platforms like Shechar are doing well today right uh, the video consumption on our platform is 400 MB a day per user but I think her point is also about not just the reach in terms of numbers but the qualitative reach right I mean there are segments which are in families even within families I mean you have a reach of 30 million right I mean what about the 700 million who are not online that's about half the country, what about them, right? right? And people who use, who access internet maybe two, three hours a day because there is no electricity or, you know, uh, they, they don't have enough money to charge their phone, so they have limited data Don't sets. worry, Mukesh is listening. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Vishaka. I think he will tell you there's electricity across India now. He wants <laughs> to tell you that. <laughs> Vishaka, what, what would be your policy intervention? So, I, uh, if I go down to the basics, it has to be education and skilling because uh, without that, you cannot have research. <laughs> and if, you, if you're not educated, if you're not aware, I think a lot of access would be pointless because you wouldn't know what to do with it. I think that's the single largest intervention that's required, whether it's at school level, at college level, and even for high-end research. And, uh, and I think it's a very generic answer, which might be true across a lot of fields, but definitely in this area. It, that the possibly is the single largest intervention. Connectivity, of course, 
I think we've all agreed that it's there now, but uh, yeah, quality may, may have to improve. The other thing that we need to look at is credible data within the country. I think they've talked about uh, lack of data um, or, or you know, the fact that you can't mine the data. Uh, in fact, globally today, 20% data is searchable, 80% lies locked in enterprises and silos, and you can't do that. That's our IBM uh, estimation. So it's a huge amount of potential to be unlocked. So I think credible data uh, is one part. Uh, and of course, education and skilling. Burgess? Uh, I'd, I'd broadly agree. Education, uh, you know, even, even folks who have internet today, for instance, right? Um, a lot of them are uneducated. A lot of them don't know how to type don't know a language. Um, so even if you have internet, you have a device, you don't have education, how do you use the internet? The power of the internet is amazing, but I think, you know, basic education, knowing how to read and write, knowing how your device works, what are the functionalities of your device, right? Um, you, Google will offer you a feature where, you know, take a picture and, and it tells you what the product is or whatever, search. But does the user know how to do it? Does he understand the power of the device he's holding in his hand? So I think education is very key. And I think the second thing for AI is a lot of smart Indian kids go off to the US, right? They study at IIT and then they run off to the US. Why? Because there's much more money over there to be made from doing work in AI and research, et cetera. So I think one thing that the government should look at is pouring more money. No, pouring more money into research, pouring more money into work in India for, for education, uh, for, for universities in India to do more work around AI. Uh, Fundamental Fun research. Yeah, fundamental research. And Rather that's what than, China has done. Exactly, right? Rather than them, some of our brightest kids are leaving the country. Instead of that, keep them here. Give them, you know, throw the money that they need to do the kind of work that China and the US are leading in. And I think we'd be far, far ahead if we do that. So I think we have a pretty curious audience now who has listened to a wide spectrum of views around data, data localization, so over to... Okay. Can we have a mic passing around? Could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, my, my name is Nishal. I am a lawyer. I work with technology laws and blockchain and other things. So I will not touch blockchains on privacy, right? Uh, I have an, a question from you, like you talking about localization and everything. Like we already have law, which does not, as legally I'm talking about, legal, legally we already have a law which does not allow any company to move the data outside India. Although it's not enforceable. There's something called SDPI rules. So there is a rule 7 which clearly says that. So I have a question with you. For example, your company, you're not charging them anything. You're taking a data from the user. And you're taking one of the data which falls under SDPI, the mobile number. So what, as a company, I wanted to understand because <coughs> this, is, this debate is also on the other side that if I don't want to give the permission, as Chief said, opt-in and opt-out, which is not even nearby, like we don't have a policy for cookie, we don't have policy for opt-in and opt-out. So it's like kind of a, when I sign up to your your application or website, so it's like a forcible, like I can't use your service. If I don't sign up, I don't agree what you're saying on the very first login page, I cannot use your service. So, so it's kind of you're forcing me. So as a company... I'm not forcing you, you want to use my service. Yeah, that, that's, the, that, that's the question comes in. So it's a notice that's and consent model, yeah. basically. And it's very clearly right. written in 10 AAA that all these agreements, which you as a company or anyone does it. 10 AAA is what? Uh, it's, it's after IT Act 2008 uh, amendment, it's already a section ah. inserted, you mean which you? very clearly says that the, the agreements which I do with you at the time of login, it's not even valid. It's subject to the case to case and everything. So my, my, my question is basically when you talk about all these things, all these things, you as a company, what you do with the data? Because that's, that is your uh, source of income. So how you are actually doing, what you're doing with the data of the uh, shared chat user and all. Like In the interest of time, let's take one round of questions and Burgess, you can respond. Uh, can we, any, any further questions? Hi, I'm Sangeeta. I work with DFID. So thank you very much for a very, uh, and it was a very interesting session. I have a question for the whole panel, actually. You started talking about how, and you're four different stakeholders in that sense, right, from the government to someone kind of doing it to the services and to 
the, you know, so, but in, at the end of the day, you started with something that this ecosystem is actually not talking to each other. And what I'd like to know from all of you, or, and it could be one bullet point to each, is how do we get the ecosystem to start talking so that all our decisions are kind of, you know, informed, our policy is informed, we are aware of the fact that everybody is a part in that policy making, we're reaching out to them. Our systems and the social media is actually facilitating all that, so. Any further questions? Hi, this is Suganda, this side again from DFID. Uh, my question again is from the panel only. So uh, I myself is from IT and uh, have been working on big data and AI uh, as a personal interest. But somewhere I get stuck is, why are we actually talking so much about AI, big data? And I see that the trend is when something happens in US and Europe, then Indians start realizing, okay, this is something that we can start working on. Why can't we actually have something original from within India, like maybe, uh, like we are now talking uh, about new innovations uh, on the platforms of AI, machine learning, big data, etc. But why can't we actually talk about something which can be an example for the whole world? For example, doing something with the climate change. I mean, it's a big issue here in India. So, and again, say, second question is why, why do we need so many social networking sites when there are so many other issues uh, for daily issues where citizens are fa which use citizens are facing, do we really need so many application of those kind? And do we really need so much of you know free internet? I mean, of course, not everybody would like to be online all the 24 hours seven. There are so many big issues that we are grappling with. So okay, I can give a quick response to that. As moderator, I like to apply some degree of question minimization here, <laughs> in the sense that you know, yeah, I agree that there are many more fundamental issues that we need to address. But then, you know, technology is one part of the India growth story, and overall, in the global sense, innovation is one of the drivers for economic growth, right? And in that sense, we have to talk about AI and big data because it's one big part of the innovation story. But uh, we'll wrap up with these two questions. So, Burgess, would you like to respond to the notice and consent question? Forget the legal, let's just look at the basic principle of taking data in return for whatever, you know, you're doing. So, to answer your basic question, what do we do with the mobile phone number? We do not share it. That's one. Two, currently we are not making any money. We are a loss-making entity. <laughs> because at some point we will make. As of today, we are not making any money, so we are not selling your data. And number three, to answer your specific questions about what we are doing with the data, we have a privacy policy which very clearly says what data we collect and what do we do with that data. And number four, I am not aware of the fact that what the IT Act says, but basic contract law will tell you that you have a terms of service. When you click here, you agree to it. You have signed a contract. I don't know what the IT Act says. I've not read Section 10 or whatever, 10 AAA. But uh, the basic principle of the Contract Act is there is a contract. You have signed that contract. You have given me certain rights. And I don't think anyone is forcing anyone to use any social media platform. You are welcome to use a Nokia 3310 and live life without the joys of what the iPhone or the Android device gives you. No one's forcing you. Right, but anyway, so... You want to respond to that? No, I want to ask him a question. So okay. I want to, I'm uh, just curious, how long is your privacy contract that shows up on your platform? And do your users, do you think your users understand it? So we are the only platform, and, and the Economic Times did a fantastic story about it. We have our Gopniyata policy, our privacy policy, or whatever you want to call it, in every one of the languages that we offer, one. Two is, it's in very simple English, it's, or whatever, simple language, it's, it's not legalese. Uh, even our community guidelines is very, like you read it and you, a five-year-old can probably understand it. Right. So I think uh, we'll stop there, Sangeeta, probably you'll have to take it offline with us because, because I've been nudged, you know, to wind up the panel. But uh, thank you all for being part of this panel. As I, as I keep saying, there are many themes on which we agree to disagree, and there are some themes on which we all agree. 
and this panel brought out all these dimensions of what uh, we think about big data and AI in India. And hopefully, we'll uh, going forward, you know, we will build something vibrant and robust. Maybe like China, maybe very different. And I personally think, I hope it's a different one. But yeah, with on that optimistic, <laughs> I mean, we on will, that, we on will that, make India great again. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll make India great again. You know, great for collaboration. <laughs> So, so much uh, for the last panel of Future Tech Festival today. Thank you all for your patient attendance and vibrant, you know, involvement in these discussions. Thanks.